and welcome to the strategic analysis on the MCS sitting for Alpaca Hotel Group for the May and August exams in 2020. And I am Joseph Boehm of Astranti and we're going to be discussing how a series of different theoretical models apply to Alpaca to then go forth and understand how we can answer some questions in the exam. So with that said, what exactly is the case? Well, we're in the hospitality industry. Alpaca are a very large luxury hotel provider where they've got 50 hotels across a group entity and they are in one single domestic market. And what's very interesting is that there is a changing trends amongst the market in terms of what people want, what kind of economic trends are around, especially with 2008 till recently, definitely lower end on terms of the sales and the overall revenues being generated by the hospitality industry, but it's now picking up now. And we also have an issue period of decline for this hotel group. So we're going to be trying to reverse that trend as we move forward. So very, very interesting. And let's get stuck in. So what exactly is strategic analysis first and foremost? Well, it's where you utilize the rational model and essentially it's where you situate where you want the business to be in terms of your mission and objectives and how then you want to govern and help or your business and manage the stakeholders alike with stakeholder mapping, for example. And from that image, from that vision of where you want the business to be, you take a look at the here and now. Where is the business currently and how do we get to the future where we want to be? And that's where we start discussing things like the SWOT, our business environment, our value chain, and our generic strategies in terms of how we want to grow and where we see the company going forwards to achieve the mission and objectives. So as mentioned, our starting point is this future. What is the mission and objectives of the business? Where do we want to be? How are we going to govern and set our ethical standpoints, our ethical positioning? And from that, how are we going to manage our stakeholder needs? So these things work hand in hand. For example, if you were a highly unethical business, you wouldn't necessarily have too much catering to a wide range of stakeholders. Whereas when you're trying to be ethical, and that is essentially what SEMA always want a business to be, then we're going to be managing stakeholder needs in a far more careful manner, for example. But that's just an example. Let's get stuck in. So the mission is essentially broken down into a few key components. First, why does it exist? That's our purpose, what we're actually trying to do and achieve. From this, we can then discuss the strategy, how the organization compete based on what it wants to do in terms of its existence. For example, Alpaca Hotel wants to be a luxury hotel provider. And as such, we have to think about how we're going to get to that stage. How are we going to reach the four and five star criteria, for example, and things like that. We can then take that strategy forward and develop the values. And this is essentially what we're trying to do as a business in terms of our viewpoints. What we're going to do in terms of quality. In our packers case, we're looking for high quality. So this means things like value for money are not going to be typical for our overall core values. In fact, we'll be looking for a cost efficiency, but it may step out of bounds of that value for money framework in terms of we want that quality to be especially high. But with that said, of course, we do want to consider obviously the cost to the business. We've seen that the co costs are out of control on the financial statements. So in this case, value for money on a sort of quality, high premium scale is applicable. Likewise, innovation could be a core value in terms of keeping up with industry trends and competing with the largest competitors and how they move and change with the market as well. Finally, from this value and strategy standpoint, what policies do we develop in which to act upon those agreed principles and strategies? With this in mind, you then have to ensure that people act in such a way, and that's where our policies are coming in, right? They're talking about how we're going to promote these values, promote this strategy, encourage the business in the right direction on a operational level amongst all staff members. 
So from this point of having a number of policies which are seeking to encourage and instill the values and strategy into our operations and our staff behavior, how do we measure our performance? It's gonna be key to measure that performance, particularly when we're seeking to be positioned in the luxury, high quality part of the industry. And as such, we need to make sure that our quality management is super high and that we're making sure we understand how far we're going or how well we're doing in the non-financial measures as well. And this means that the balanced scorecard approach is very appropriate to use. We have a number of perspectives and the financial perspective is just one. We don't have this profit-centric outlook. In fact, we're looking at our learning, so the number of high-quality recruits, hours spent on training. We can look at in the internal perspective, such as employee utilization, which I did cite as a little bit of a fear when we went through the different financials because we had operational costs rocketing up, but no actual additional revenue generated from those costs. So that could be an issue as well. Again, that's where the balance scorecard can help us get a bigger picture compared to just the financials. And finally, you have things like the customer perspective, which will include measures such as the number of customers, complaints and services rendered and customer satisfaction, which is going to be super key in terms of understanding what can be improved and instilling that kind of TQM mindset if that was to be the case. And again, I do encourage you to utilize models such as TQM to help you develop a good response to how we're going to manage performance and ensure it's a high quality or a high standard rather. So from this point, we also have to consider the governance. How is it that we're going to set up our board to enable our success? So essentially, we can often rely quite heavily on the UK Code of Corporate Governance to sort of give us the key rundown or the key principles of what makes a good board composition and a governance structure. And we don't need to know it off by heart, and we can't necessarily assume it in the case of Maylandia, but typically SEMA use that as the pro forma for the governance expectations in a given country. So this would mean a separate chairman and CEO to keep the powers distanced. We also have independent non-executive directors, again, to make sure that there's a level of balance to the opinions, the self-interest and the agency problem are differentiated when you have these non-executive directors. Likewise, with an audit, nomination and remuneration committees, especially with listed entities. And this is a key point actually as we move forwards. We can see that in terms of applying this key structure, we actually have a quoted entity, which means they're duty bound to governance regulations, typically something like what we just saw on the previous slide with the UK. However, there is no mention of these committees in the pre-scene. So this could be a key topic in terms of setting them up or in terms of getting further information and deciding as to whether we're doing it correctly or doing a good job of our governance. We also have a divisional structure, which is an important facet. We went through the pros and cons in the, in the pre-scene analysis videos, but just to give you a brief overview, some of the key issues that arise are perhaps competition between divisions because they have some duplicate functions, some poor communication because you typically don't work very close geographically in the different divisions. However, we saw that those divisional managers do work in a central location, so that will mitigate that problem. And in terms of benefits, we get that area specialism because staff are really used to and fully understand the local demographic of that division. Again, we had no mention of NEDs or the board composition, so this could be a key topic where we have to analyze any improvements we can make to governance or perhaps we're responding to a, an article that's sort of making, not making fun, sorry, sort of downplaying our governance structure as not appropriate given our status in the industry. And this brings us also to ethics. How do we want to situate value-wise as our business? And most importantly to mention is that ethics has played a major part in pretty much every exam variant for a very, very long time. And this is because SEMA want to be seen to be testing it and want to be seen to be encouraging ethical practices. So it might be that you have a specific ethical requirement 
However, you could also consider the ethical and corporate social responsibility elements to any section that is brought up in the exam. So if we're given an unseen material that is pushing us in the direction of risk management or a new project, we can always bring in ethical concerns or how we're dealing with, say, the local community, like we saw with the pie shop article, how we're managing those responsibilities inside that question as well. If there is scope, use your judgment. Typically, it's very clear what the sort of boundaries of the question are in the exam. So on the following page, we have some key issues that are maybe mentioned in the case. But overall, if you need extra guidance on ethics and CSR, we do have a specific ethics pack for our case studies. So the most obvious ethical issues that could arise from this case is the treatment of staff. And this is because of how important they are and how the industry has a number of issues in terms of underpaying the unskilled labor, for example. So the treatment of staff could easily be a public relations CSR ethical issue in terms of alpaca. We also have no CSR report, which means that there's definitely scope for a number of stakeholders to be completely upset with the lack of information and clarity about what we're doing as a business and we'll seek maybe further explanations or information and this would sort of imply that we have this integrated reporting perhaps again it's quite hard for the examiner to work integrated reporting into a question so this could be one of the key areas where they do so finally reducing the environmental footprint was cited in terms of a loose mention of the environment and caring about it in our values and missions etc and with this in mind it could then be a key issue in terms of maybe a supplier isn't very ethical in terms of environmental footprint or perhaps we've got a specific function in our business that has a disproportionately high environmental impact that we need to correct. Some other more generic issues that could arise are just professional ethics such as you know, fraudulent behavior and bribery in terms of you know maybe a CEO is bribing for a certain contract or to get a certain deal done it's always unacceptable again always accepting the moral high ground and saying it's the right thing to do to not do these things and as such those are sort of the more generic ones that could arise but these are a little bit more fringe look more at the ones we just looked at in the previous slide they're the more likely candidates for an ethical issue I hope you enjoyed that free sample of our material at Strante and I would just like to take a moment to walk you through what else we do in terms of both the case study and just generally across all of our modules. So first and foremost, we have study text for both the case study in each and every module for SEMA. And this is essentially going to focus on, for the MCS at least, the theory that might be coming up, what could be used, a bit of a revision crash course, and also the exam technique that we recommend for passing the exam. We obviously have the course videos as well, which cover that study text in great detail in terms of walking you through it in a video presentation as opposed to written study text. And as you will know, probably we have the pre-scene analysis and industry analysis, which are predicated on each and every sitting that comes up for the case study. We also do mock exams. Now, these are one of the most popular products, particularly with marking and feedback, because they offer a more real world feedback session with a qualified marker that will give you feedback on where you're going wrong, what can be improved, what you're doing well, and stuff like that for the different mock exams. And we have a great expertise across the team in developing very accurate and well-crafted mock exams for the case study. And that's something that is very, very popular. Finally, we also have the masterclasses. Now these are sort of like a video format revision cram where you've got everything that you could possibly need for the pre-scene in one condensed lecture over a number of hours. I believe it is two to three hours typically with a lunch break. And essentially we've got this very, very long and comprehensive class where you can ask questions, you can view the lecture, and just absorb all the information that you may need. It assumes zero prior knowledge. So it's very useful if you're feeling behind, especially. But of course, very helpful as well, just to be at the sort of complete preparedness you can be. 
And just before I leave you, I would like to point out that we have a pass guarantee. And this is essentially where as long as you fill out a few forms that show us that you have undertaken our material and unfortunately failed, we will allow for you to have the next case sitting free of charge for the case study because of the fact that you have bought the complete pack and you have unfortunately not passed. As long as you've utilized that, we're confident enough in our materials that we are happy to give you a guarantee, a free use of the next case studies materials because we think you'll pass with our materials without shadow of a doubt. So thank you very much for listening to this quick ad and I hope you use us in the future.